Hey everyone, Callum here, and today we have a wee project that I am calling an imperfect restoration. You see, on YouTube these days, we have a lot of perfect restorations. They turn old, rusty objects such as this unassuming knife into light new, unblemished works of art. But sometimes I find that process of, of stripping back and completely restoring to be quite sad and destructive. And I've always enjoyed actually feeling the age and the history and the natural wear and tear within the things that I own. And this knife and what I want to do with it is hopefully a good example of my sort of ongoing project to stabilize and preserve some of the older, more precious to me items that I own, but without removing the character from them that makes me love them so much or making them so perfect that I feel like I can't really ever use them again. So disclaimer, I'm telling you right now, if you are hoping by the end of the video that I turn this into some kind of like new knife that you could pick up from Ikea with a beautiful smooth blade and a newly freshly cut hardwood handle, you are going to be severely disappointed. What we actually have here is an old fish knife or gutting knife that has sat in my grandfather's shed, which is now my workshop, for decades. It's the initial carved into the handle though that has always really excited me and it's a mark from the original owner himself, a certain John Gillis, who was my grandfather's father and means that this particular knife is probably approaching or passing a century old. There are deep rusty grooves and dents and scratches running along the blade as well as the tang or the, the shank which is the back portion of the blade and it was all originally held together by these three brass pins which held these carved wooden handle slabs on either side of the metal tang. After an initial sanding to see what we were dealing with, the first step was to remove those brass pins or rivets. I was very keen though to ensure that these were kept and this is a theme that I'm sticking to. Like everything with this knife, they are clearly hand cut and handmade and it's important to me that those went back in as they are an integral part of trying to hold on to and preserve as much as possible of what makes this knife the object that it is. As you've probably seen in my other videos, my interests often focus on the unusual, the small details, maybe the more hidden or underappreciated devices and objects in history. When I go to a museum, I don't really have much interest in jewellery or fancy examples of wealth. What I really enjoy are tools and bolts and old computers, engines and cars and diggers, and the things which helped build the history which we see around us to this day. John Gillis, or Ian Handy as he was known to most people back then, was my great-grandfather and my father's grandfather. They came from a tiny island called Flada, which is located in the north above the tiny island of Rasse, where I'm from. Flada is a beautiful, picturesque island in the sound of Rasse. It's got stunning views over to the Isle of Skye, and the name comes from the Old Norse. It means flat island, which is why there are actually a number of Fladas found all around the Scottish islands, and it is now completely uninhabited. All that's really remaining is the peaceful former crofting community, which are now holiday homes. The last full-time residents left in the 1960s, but back then when Ian Handy and his family, which includes my grandfather, grew up there, they lived a tough remote life on what was a small tidal island, very much isolated from the rest of the world. Living and working on Flada meant hard work, manual labour, and few of the luxuries or amenities that we would take for granted now. They wouldn't have held on to the sort of nostalgic, sentimental connection that I do to these tools, but they would never have taken them for granted or simply disposed of them when they no longer needed them. Everything was saved, nothing was wasted, and as a result, much of this stuff now simply sits collecting dust and rusting away in these sheds. So 
So as you can see, I did numerous passes on this to try and clean it up a little bit and get the worst of the rust out of the blade. Sanding, wire brushes, rust remover, vinegar, sandblasting. I polished it with industrial polishers as well as going over it with cleaners such as Barkeeper's Friend. Like I mentioned though, the intention was never to remove everything. The blade is never going to be truly clean and it's never going to be like new. And I don't mind that. The sort of patina I think adds to the character of it. And to be honest, these blades were never perfectly smooth. They were, like the rest of this thing, handmade. And a lot of these marks probably came from when it was still in use. And I don't want to be starting to remove those things in an attempt to make it look like some sort of brand new example. The other risk, of course, is that going over it with a grinder or a polisher is only going to make the blade thinner and perhaps more brittle. And then at that point, you risk actually breaking it entirely. After cleaning up the blade as best as possible though, we move on to the wood. Now I wanted to ensure that I was as careful as possible with this, as this is the part that was most likely to break or be damaged, and it also contains the most valuable aspect of the blade, which I think is this lovely hand cut initial. Now the handle looks to be entirely cut by hand as well, and although I can't tell what kind of wood it is, it's certainly some kind of hardwood. It's got a very fine grain, there are very few dents that you can make in it with a fingernail as well. I was also lucky in that there was no rot, there was no softness to it, and of course there was no woodworm, which is a problem around here sometimes too. So the first step was to cover the outside of the handles, including the lovely J carving with some tape and then start just lightly sanding off any of the buildup of rust from where the tang had been in contact with the handle slabs. On the actual face of the handles there was some small paint splashes, there was a few pieces of concrete and hard grit and I removed those from the surface just so it would be in the best condition for treatment. To actually treat the wood, I went for linseed oil, and unfortunately my camera only caught the end of the treatment, but I wanted to go for something that was as natural and as gentle as possible. Linseed oil is really fantastic stuff, but you've got to be quite patient with it. It will sort of bleed in and out of the wood for days afterwards, and it's also something that they would have used back then. So it seems a little bit more period appropriate to go for that compared to any other kind of varnishes or, or oils in that way. There wasn't a whole lot to do with the brass pins. Obviously, they were very soft, so you've got to be quite careful with them. And I did try to reshape them ever so slightly at the end so they would go back into the wood a little bit easier. But uh, all I really did was gently sanded them to remove the rust and the dirt. And then I just tried to reshape those ends a little bit. So with the blade and the tang cleaned up, wood handles treated and the three brass pins ready, it was time for reassembly. I started by putting the pins back into the tang, which was easy enough, and then lining it up with the two slab handles on either side. It was a little bit trickier though, as the holes for the pins were slightly too tight at both the entry and exit points for the blade. I tried to squash them down a little bit in the vise, but in the end what I did was I used an awl to sort of give the hole a little bit more of a countersink, and luckily 
Usually the wood is a little bit softer with the linseed oil having soaked in as well. With the tang then sandwiched between the two slabs and then lined up correctly, I then just gently hammered in the wood inserts onto both sides of the tang. It was still quite tight and unfortunately this is where some of the damage occurred. The wooden slab without the initial had a slight crack in the topmost rivet hole and I guess the pin coming back through the wood was the final straw and a small section sort of chipped off. Luckily it had all come out in one piece. So what I ended up doing was I just took a little bit of super glue to it, placed it back in and then gently sanded over it and it hit it relatively well. Again I, I don't want to be too precious about this. I expected I was going to get a little mistakes and breakages here and there and the point was to try and make it functioning and working again and in a similar sort of way to how my great grandfather would probably have done it if he had found this knife sitting in the shed as I did. One thing I do know he would have done would have been to sharpen it. My grandfather still proudly sharpens all of his knives and he's got his own whetstone in his shed that he uses and luckily in this workshop I had a whetstone that was perfectly suited for it. It seems Ian Handy had carved his full initials into this block and it had been sitting next to the knife on the same shelf for years. So perhaps the last time this knife had been sharpened was with this same old whetstone all those decades ago. Now, my knife sharpening skills are not perfect, but then again, neither is this block, neither is this knife, and neither is this restoration. What I enjoy about making and creating isn't trying to become an expert in anything. It's about learning and adapting and going, well, yeah, I can give that a try. I sort of always consider this the true mark of an islander. It's the ability to be self-sufficient and I don't really mean it so much in growing your own food or generating your own electricity or something. It's more that ability to be able to just jump into jobs and take on tasks without maybe worrying so much about whether you can do it or not but just by accepting the fact that you sort of have to. So this is it, the finished article and like I promised a perfectly imperfect restoration. I'm really quite pleased with how this came out and I've now put on the second coat of linseed oil and it's been about two, three weeks since I actually put it all together again. Now, I really don't know what I'm going to do with this. It'll probably sit on my desk as a sort of fancy letter opener in some ways, but I'm very happy with it. I also took it into my grandfather's house and we gave it the usual test that he applies after he sharpened a knife and that is cutting into little bits of paper and it passed that test with flying colours, so that's all that's important. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed watching this. Like I say, it's not exactly the most satisfying restoration, but it is a little bit more of an insight into my process and what I enjoy about old objects. And I'm looking forward to bringing some more tools and artefacts off the shelves and trying to turn them into something useful and, and working objects again without removing that character and what makes them interesting to me in the first place. But anyway, thanks for watching. I am going to go open some letters with my great-grandfather's homemade knife. Bye-bye.